Hi everyone, my name is Elsie Charity and my pronouns are she and they. I'm the Director of Programs and Culture at the National Science and Technology Medals Foundation. We are so excited to have you all here for our STEM Spotlight event with Ellen Ochoa. I'd like to first thank Dr. Ellen Ochoa for being here to share her experiences and advice with all of you tonight. And a special thank you to Ms. Ann Lee who will be leading this discussion. Finally, a thank you to the students from the Society of Women in Engineering at the University of Chicago for participating in this conversation. It's our mission to build diverse and inclusive STEM communities that are equitable and truly representative of our society. So where do we start? In classrooms and webinars, just like this one, highlighting voices that are often left out of the conversation and creating spaces where students like yourselves can both learn from and relate to experts who share our goals for the future of STEM. What we hope to show through this conversation and all of our programming is that there isn't one way to build a STEM career and there certainly isn't one perfect path to success, but there are at every turn incredible role models and mentors that you can look to for advice and inspiration. We hope that tonight's conversation with Dr. Ochoa and Ms. Lee serves as one such reflection point for you along your way. We encourage you to join in the conversation and in doing so help us create an inclusive and safe space for all. When using the chat or asking questions, please take a moment to reflect on how your language may be perceived by the others here. Thank you for your contributions and for helping us create a respectful environment where everyone feels welcome to listen, to share, and to enjoy. One final note before we get started, if you have any technical issues, please text Allison Corton and she'll help you troubleshoot. She will drop her phone number in the chat now and her contact information was listed in the event email that we sent out earlier today. Now I'll turn it over to Ms. Lee to kick off our discussion. Welcome to the National Science and Technology Medals Foundation STEM Spotlight Series, where we meet with the top minds in STEM to learn more about their paths to success. I'm Anne Lee, a fourth year student at the University of Chicago, majoring in astrophysics and geophysical sciences. Talking with me today is Dr. Ellen Ochoa, the first Latina astronaut. She is also the former director of NASA's Johnson Space Center and is the current chair of the National Science Board, among many other activities as well. As an astronaut, she logged nearly 1,000 hours in orbit and flew in space four times. Dr. Ochoa, thank you so much for joining me, Society of Women Engineers and additional students at UChicago today. Well, thanks. It's great to be here. And thank you so much, Anne, for agreeing to moderate today. Awesome. Yeah, so to get started, it seems like your job spans science, engineering, public engagement, and management. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little about your education and career path that has led you here. Sure. You know, um, I really got to science and engineering a lot later um, than a lot of people did. But maybe um, some of the students listening can sort of uh, relate to, you know, not knowing any scientists or engineers when I grew up. And for some reason, I, you know, I just didn't think I was interested and it wasn't a path that I was pursuing. Uh, fortunately, I liked math. I, I did well in it. So in high school, I, you know, took all the math that they offered, which included the first uh, semester of, of college uh, calculus. So I attended my local university, actually lived at home while I was an undergrad. And I was originally thinking I might major in music or in business. Um, but I continued to take math and I was finishing up the calculus series um, the second year I was there talking to some of the other students. And it was clear they were all in there because they were either majoring in math or engineering or physics. And, and this was a required course. And I was just kind of doing it to, um, for fun and to finish up um, uh, the series. So I decided to talk to a couple of professors and find out more about those subjects. So I went and talked to a professor in the electrical engineering department. And uh, unfortunately, he made it very clear that he wasn't at all interested in having me in his department. You know, he talked about, well, we had a woman come through this department once, um, but I really don't think that you'd be interested in, in and it's a difficult course of study, uh, which was kind of ironic because I literally set up this appointment with him to find out more uh, about it and whether I'd be interested. But luckily, when I went and talked to the physics professor, I got a much different response. Um, he seemed excited that I was interested to learn more about physics. 
Um, he told me about some of the careers that people have after they major in physics, which was actually really important to me because I didn't have a good concept of that. And it's pretty hard to choose something to major in if you can't, can't really picture you know, what that leads to <laughs> after college. And then he did ask about my math background and I told him I was finishing up the calculus series. And he said, well, that's great because you know, you've learned the language of physics. And so if you started into physics the next semester, you could really concentrate on the concepts. Whereas most people are trying to learn those simultaneously. And I think you'll do really well. And, you know, that wasn't something I really thought about. So in fact, I, you know, I did start out in physics the next semester and ended up selecting it as my major. And that's really what got me started uh, in all of this. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Jane. That's really cool how like the physics professor had such a big impact on what you then chose to major yeah. in. So you pivoted from considering majoring in music, you mentioned, to then later on graduating with an undergraduate right. degree in physics, and then later on even getting a PhD in electrical engineering. And we have many women in STEM listening on the call today, and many of us are figuring out what's next in our education or our careers. So what advice would you give to someone who is trying to choose between two different fields, such as art and science, or even two similar fields like science and engineering? Yeah, for me, um, what was important, even after I decided not to major in music, was I wanted to be at places where I could still participate in the music department, you know, generally through performance, right? So um, in college, I was in the marching band a couple of years. I was in the wind ensemble the whole time I was there. And then even when I went off to graduate school, um, by that time I was, you know, basically committing to um, a graduate degree in engineering and, uh, and looking to pursue research. But I, I still was really interested in music and I wanted to go to a school where there were uh, performance groups that I could participate in. I took um, flute lessons the whole time I was at Stanford and played um, in the symphony and chamber orchestra there part of the time, but also gave, gave several solo recitals. So, you know, as you consider uh, where you might go, first of all, as an undergraduate, you want to see, hey, is there opportunity if I go there to pursue more than one interest? Um, you know, whether it's just the opportunity to take classes or, you know, Sometimes there's dual majors or you want to design an individualized major. And, you know, some schools just um, sort of allow you to do that in a way that other schools don't. And then even in graduate school, um, that definitely affected my choice of graduate school was that they should have a music department and something I could um, perform in and continue that interest as well. You know, I know finances are often an issue. You know, I was... Um, fortunate that at San Diego State, I mentioned I was living at home. At that time, it actually didn't have tuition. And I had a small scholarship that paid fees, you know, books, parking, health, health fees. And that made it a little bit easier for me to take a longer time to decide what to major in and to take a whole variety of classes. And I know sometimes that's a, a barrier for students as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess with that scholarship, like how did you go about getting or finding that opportunity? And yeah, do you have any advice for other people who are like, you know, similarly might have that financial burden? Like how do they mm -hmm. overcome that? Well, um, you know, these days you can at least, um, you know, search the internet and look for uh, different kinds of scholarships and fellowships. Um, you know, it's back when I was in high school, it was really maybe you talk to a college counselor who would help do it. Um, I had actually applied for a California State Scholarship, um, but when I ended up deciding to go to San Diego State and living at home, um, because it really didn't have tuition, um, it, they, there was nothing so much for them to pay for, so I didn't really get that scholarship. I, I would have gotten it if I'd gone to another school. Mm -hmm. um, but then I found out from San Diego State itself that they had an opportunity for you know, fees to be paid. So checking with a school that you wanna to go to and then um, with a variety of different professional organizations that want to help out students, particularly in certain fields of study. And there, there are a lot more available now for um, people who are underrepresented in STEM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. 
Uh, and then actually, so going to an audience question about music and STEM, how has music helped you in STEM? Well, you know, there do seem to be a lot of people who are both interested in music and science. Um, and so I don't know, you know, in terms of my brain or how I approach things, you know, how that might have influenced one way or the other. But I can tell you one thing I felt I got from it because I was performing in groups. Um, there's a teamwork aspect to that, right? Uh, where, you know, if you're in an orchestra um, or wind ensemble or a marching band, um, you both sort of uh, have to work on your own skills, right? So you can get better and sort of improve um, what you can contribute to the group. And then you need to understand what it is the group is trying to contribute as a whole and making sure that you're a part of that. And so I often tell students, um, that's exactly what we need to do when we're in the astronaut corps or really any job that, you know, in human space flight where you're part of trying to make that mission happen. You're always trying to work on your own skills and making sure that you're improving and learning and bringing more to it. But your, your eye has to be on what's the big picture? What are we trying to accomplish here? And in what ways can I contribute to that mission? Mm -hmm. So I, I think just that whole outlook was also really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, so yeah, so going on about like what you're saying about being an astronaut, uh, you actually applied twice, right, to be an astronaut, like first in 1987, and mm -hmm. then you were later selected in 1990. Uh, could you talk about what drove you to apply again? And what did you maybe learn from the first round or application that you then applied to the second round? Well, once you kind of look into the whole astronaut application process, you realize that not very many people get selected the first time they apply. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, some of the my classmates, people who were selected at the same time I was, they had applied um, multiple times over a dozen years, um, you know, ever since they started um, selecting astronauts for the space shuttle program. So, it, you know, it wasn't a bad thing. It was, it was all to the good that you continued to sort of add new skills maybe or more work experience and then showed that you were interested enough to persevere. And the way they did it is um, you could send in your application at any time. And then when NASA would decide to select a group of astronauts, it might be after two years, three years, four years, five years, it just depends on when they need them. They'll look at all the applicants that they have received since the previous time they selected and they'll sort of give a deadline and then they'll review all of those. Well, so once you've sent it in the first time, you have the opportunity to just sort of update it every year, you know, maybe new work experience, new skills, and, they'll, and then you'll be considered for the next selection. Um, a couple of things I learned after the first time, and I, I did get to the point where I got to go to Johnson Space Center and spend a week there, mm -hmm. um, talk to actual astronauts about the job, you know, um, tour the training facilities, get a very thorough medical exam. But I could tell a couple of ways in which I could improve my application. One was that I really didn't have any operational experience. You know, I worked in a lab. Um, I wrote up research results, presented them at conferences, published but um, hadn't really demonstrated anything on the operational side. So I did decide to get a private pilot's license mm -hmm. and um, which is something that brings its own benefits, you know, whether or not you're selected, but uh, also would give you that opportunity to, um, you know, have to make decisions that can actually affect, you know, your life and death, just, to, you know, depending on um, what situation you might find yourself in. And then I also decided I wanted to work for NASA, whether or not I was selected as an astronaut. I just want, I wanted to be part of their mission. I was currently working at a Department of Energy lab, um, but what I was working on optical information processing, there, you know, there was really only just three of us working on it. And it wasn't something that was gonna become a, you know, a big effort for that lab. Um, so I ended up moving to one of NASA's research centers, Ames Research Center in California. So th those were a couple of things that I did um, after the first time I interviewed and, and before the mm -hmm. second time. Yeah, yeah. What advice would you have then for someone who has maybe tried something they're really excited about and maybe failed at it the first time? You know, how do they know to keep going and keep trying? Well, first of all, you know, I always um, kind of think like, 
um, you know, maybe that's not exactly a failure to me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even though I wasn't selected the first time, and I, of course I was really disappointed because I was so excited about, about the job, but I, you know, I didn't consider it failure. I mean, first of all, you have to put it in perspective, you know, thousands of people apply. And I think, um, you know, 11 or 12 people were selected that first time out of those thousands. Um, and I wasn't one of them. Um, it, that didn't seem like a failure. I mean, I wasn't sure I would ever hear back from NASA at all when I sent in my <laughs> application. So the fact that I learned more about the job, you know, I had a chance to actually go to Johnson Space Center, learn more about the job, you know, try to decide if I really thought it was for me or not. And of course, like I said, I was, I was just really excited about it. You know, it gave me more information. It made me more excited about doing it, you know, but I was also realistic. I might never get selected, but it led me to something that I was even more interested in than I was doing currently, which was to, to work for NASA and do research there, which you know, might be applicable someday to a, a, a spaceflight mission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so your love for NASA, I guess, extended even after you finished being an astronaut because you were then the deputy director or yes. the director of the NASA Johnson Space Center. Exactly. Uh, yeah, could you talk a little about why did you take up this role and what did your day-to-day -day look like in that position? You know, what is this, what does this director position mean? Like, what does it look like? Well, I'd had the chance to be on four space shuttle missions. And by the time I came back from the fourth one, you know, I was one of the most experienced astronauts in the office. And I had also performed a lot of the jobs that um, astronauts get assigned to, including some of the leadership roles in the office. So there was a question of sort of what comes next. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't that I might not ever fly again, but I assumed it would be quite a number of years before I might get assigned again because of the fact that at that point, over half the people in the office had never flown at all. And we were really, you know, as one of the leaders in the office, we were really, now that we were into the assembly of the International Space Station, one of our goals was to get those folks flight assignments. So, so for me, that meant I, there probably wouldn't be an assignment for me for quite a while. So it was a good opportunity to look around. And then I got offered a position, uh, which was the deputy director of the organization that manages both uh, the astronaut office and our aircraft ops division. And it, it just seemed like uh, the right time in my career to, to go ahead and make that move. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, so then following that, you then later took on the position of director. Was there like a difference in the types of tasks you were doing on a day to day between those two positions? Well, first of all, in that, in sort of that first management role after leave, uh, leaving the office, um, I had a lot more different types of responsibilities than I did as a, a member of the astronaut office. So mm -hmm. all of a sudden now you're concerned with, personnel issues, with budget issues, mm -hmm. policy issues. And I got a much wider view and started to meet other people in management at Johnson Space Center. And after being in that position a few years, I was then director of that organization. It was called the Flight Crew Operations Directorate. Mm -hmm. um, then I was asked to be the deputy center director. And it was kind of funny because the center director asked me about it. And um, I still felt like I had a lot to learn in a position that I had just gotten into less than a year before that. So, you know, my first response was, I, I think I want to be in this current position a little bit longer and learn more about it and be able to accomplish more. Mm -hmm. And then he said, did I mention that I won't take no for an answer? And I was like, <laughs> oh, well, that, that's something good to know. <laughs> so I have to admit, I was pushed a little bit into that deputy center director role. Uh, we kind of joke about it to this day. But then, you know, again, that takes you up another level in terms of what you get to see around the center, how you um, are looking way beyond your own organization and understanding how all the different organizations work together to make it happen, including a lot of um, organizations like, um, you know, human resources and procurement and our, our group of lawyers and mm -hmm. things that, um, aren't directly related to our operations in space, but for, which without them, you know, they actually don't happen. And uh, when he retired a few years later, uh, fortunately, he had, 
you know, really allowed me to see and do all the different aspects that a center director does, mm -hmm. and uh, which I think helped to make me a strong candidate. And then I was selected as the center director. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, it's also really interesting to hear about the entire journey and the experiences that you gained to get there. Uh, so then now going on to your um, experience as chair for the National Science Board, could you talk a little about what that looks like? And um, also, I think one of the attendees asked, what are your favorite and least favorite aspects of your current job? So um, I don't know if they they were talking about my NASA job or maybe what I'm doing now at the National Science Board, but let me talk a little bit about the Science Board first. Um, so this is a board that governs the National Science Foundation, NSF. It actually has two roles. Uh, we, along with the NSF director, we govern and set policy for NSF. And then we also act as an independent group of advisors for uh, the president, the administration, mm -hmm. and the Congress. So we develop reports that talk about uh, the strength of the science and engineering enterprise in our country and where we think we need to put more emphasis, for example. What, um, obviously, one of the things that we've talked about in a recent report is really the need to have a much more diverse uh, domestic STEM workforce and uh, steps that we need to take to be able to make that happen. So we have uh, 24 people on the board. Um, we have terms that operate kind of like the US Senate. In other words, our terms are six years long and every two years, a third of us uh, roll off and then new members are added and they're appointed by the current president at, at that time, you know, every two years. So when you look at everybody on the board, they've, they're people that have been appointed by um, usually two or three, maybe even four different presidents. So we, are, um, we operate as a, as a nonpartisan board, really just um, focused on science and engineering and um, try to provide good advice and, um, and governing and oversight of NSF. Mm -hmm. So what I like about that job is, you know, I've gotten the opportunity to stay involved in the science and engineering enterprise in our country, even after retiring from NASA, which obviously is a, is a passion for me. Um, and um, being associated with NSF that funds, you know, fundamental research in institutions all over the country uh, is something that I'm, I'm proud to be associated with. Mm -hmm. If you go back to my center director job, you know, to me, it's about, um, you know, first of all, accomplishing our mission, you know, advancing human space flight and being able to do it from a perspective where you really get to see sort of how all the parts put, uh, get put together as well as the other you know, major job of running a large organization is taking care of your people. So you know, looking out for their health and safety, making sure they get training and development opportunities, focusing a lot on diversity and inclusion and, and a culture of welcoming people uh, you know, into, into our workforce. And uh, those are all things that I was really happy to have the opportunity to do. Yeah, so building off of diversity inclusion and also STEM outreach, we have a question from an audience member, um, Madison Bloomer, listening from Pasco, Washington. And uh, they say that they're very proud to have a local middle school named after you. Uh, yeah. What made you interested in STEM outreach in this way? And when do you think is the most important time to introduce kids to STEM to encourage and foster interest? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to actually have six schools named after me. And the one in Pasco that, um, you know, Ellen Ochoa uh, Middle School was the very first one um, named after me. And I got to go there when the school opened up and they, and they dedicated it. And I've been back a few times. So, it, you know, it wasn't something I initiated. I, I uh, heard about it from the school board after they had proposed the name. And um, to me, it was something I'd never thought about before, <laughs> until, you know, until, I, until they reached out to me. But in some ways, it really represents you know, everything that I think is important. Because for years, I'd gone around talking about how education was the key to you know, me having the career that I had and the opportunity to participate in something um, that I found challenging and interesting that benefited people on earth. Uh, and so um, you know, having a school where uh, uh, 
people are, you know, not only learning about me, but other people like me and just careers in STEM in general is uh, a, a great way to do outreach even when I can't be there in person. Mm-hmm. And, and I do think middle school is a very critical age. Um, that is often, um, you know, research will show where students either sort of tend to decide they're going to be interested in STEM and, and make plans in high school to take classes or decide that they're not interested in, or, you know, look around and don't really see other people like them who have chosen those careers. And um, so in some cases, that's the first thing that just even unconsciously, they may think this must not be for me. Um, so um, talking about it in middle school and giving them examples of all different kinds of people from all different kinds of backgrounds. And of course, you know, STEM itself covers such a wide variety of topics. Um, hopefully they, in their schools, um, the students get some kind of hands-on activity and, and that can include coding too. It's not always Um, you know, hardware or experiments in a lab or something like that, Uh, but something that makes it um, sort of real to them, that science isn't just a collection of facts or vocabulary words that you need to memorize. You know, it's a way that you learn about the world. It's a way that you can then um, use that knowledge to help solve challenges um, that are important to you or your loved ones or your community. Yeah, so earlier you mentioned that there's that kind of like physics professor that helped you know, get you interested in a physics yeah. major more. So how critical would you say mentoring has been to your career path and your success? And also how can someone find a good mentor and build a really quality mentor into your relationship? So that was a great example of, I'm not sure my career would have happened if that um, professor hadn't, you know, expressed um, interest and, and really answered my questions and gave me information and seemed to be welcoming me into um, into his department. So in that sense, it was you know it was absolutely critical for me, and um, I, and I can give you other examples throughout um, uh, my education and my uh, career where people um, helped me, supported me, encouraged me, gave me some information. I had a summer job at a research lab. And uh, the staff member there, one of the very few women staff members there um, that I worked for, she was really the first one that talked to me about graduate school hmm. and, and you know, pointed out that really the people that got to design experiments and really sort of choose what they were interested in researching all had advanced degrees and that that was something that uh, you know, maybe I could consider. And that was really the first time that I started thinking about graduate school. And even up to the point, um, you know, where I'm deputy center director and the person that I'm working for who's the center director really made a point of making sure that I saw all aspects of his job so that I would be a strong candidate at some point when, when he decided to retire. So I do think it's critical. Um, and then I, you know, I had never really formally gone up to somebody and asked them to be my mentor. But when I was at Johnson Space Center, I did participate as a mentor to people there. And we did have both informal mentoring, but also a formal mentoring program. Um, And interestingly, I just participated in a podcast that the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine have put together called The Science of Mentoring. And they've actually done research about what kind of mentoring is is most helpful. And usually it's most helpful when there's some kind of structure to it. And what we did at Johnson Space Center is um, we had folks, um, a mentor and a mentee talk and agree on some framework, like how long is this relationship gonna last? How often approximately are we gonna meet? Had the mentor talk about, uh, you know, list hey, here's three areas where I really feel that you as a mentor, because of your experience, because of your background, um, can help me and that I'd really like to talk to you about. And I think that really helps you get the most out of a relationship. But I also think people shouldn't just think like you have one mentor, right? I mean, there are lots of different kinds of people with different experiences that can be helpful to you. For example, if you're in an organization, 
you may be a member of an upper underrepresented group, right? A woman or Hispanic or black in STEM. And you may wanna to talk to somebody like you to understand how they navigated that environment. But think about how it can also be really helpful for you to talk to someone who's in the majority culture, who can tell you, well, this is what we look for when we're promoting people. And you know, these are the things that are important in our environment that may not be that obvious to you. So oftentimes you want a variety of different people that you can talk to and learn from, you know, as a, as a, a mentee mentor relationship. Awesome. Yeah. And then, so as a Hispanic woman, you may have found yourself at times to be the only person who looks like you in a room or in a meeting. And one of our audience attendees actually asked, you know, coming from one of the few women in an astrophysics lab, do you ever experience imposter syndrome? And how do you reaffirm yourself? How do you get past any feelings of imposter syndrome? Well, you know, it can certainly be easy to look around a room and get this feeling of, I don't seem to belong here. <laughs> you know, there's nobody else that kind of looks like me. Um, but, you know, I, I think instead you need to reframe it in your own mind and think about what it is that you can bring to an organization, to a particular meeting to um, you know, some goal that maybe you're trying to achieve within an organization. You know, and think about at the very least, even if you're pretty new, you can think, well, I can bring hard work. You know, um, I can help this team deliver a result. You know, I, maybe I have the ability to help define or determine the focus for how we're gonna move forward. You know, um, I, I can bring in my ideas, even if I still have a lot to learn, I'm you know, a fairly new person. Um, so, uh, don't, don't psych yourself out <laughs> by, by wondering if you should be there. Um, think about all the attributes that you know you can bring, um, and say, Hey, they need me in this meeting. You know, maybe curiosity is something I bring or creativity, or again, the ability to get along with a lot of different kinds of people. That's actually a really important skill. And sometimes people don't give them cre themselves credit for these skills that can really um, help an organization achieve its mission. Mm -hmm. And then kind of building on the like feeling of imposter syndrome where you know maybe sometimes it's uh, fear of failure. Would you be willing to share what was your greatest failure or greatest challenge in your career slash life? You know, what did you learn from it? Well, you know, overall, um, in my NAS career, I think our, our biggest collective failure uh, during the time I was there was the loss of the Space Shuttle Columbia and, and her crew. And, you know, I wasn't directly involved in the decisions during that um, flight, but I was in a position where I probably could have asked more questions and tried to learn more about what they had actually seen during the launch. Um, but we did have the opportunity um, and I specifically had the opportunity because I, I grew into a position where I was the person that gave the go, no go on launch day for the crew to say, you know, do I feel we're ready to go launch? Um, so it was really important for me to learn from that experience. And um, as we thought about what we learned, um, obviously there were some technical things we needed to change about how we process the shuttle that would stop that particular problem from happening again, where foam came off the external tank and, and caused a hole in the leading edge of the wing. But a lot of what we learned was um, about listening, about communicating. And to me, uh, really fostering that culture of inclusion was a critically important thing based on that incident. Because people have to feel valued and respected to speak up in meetings, to ask questions, to maybe um, bring up some information or data that either hasn't been brought up or that they don't think has been fully appreciated um, during the conversation that they're listening to. So if you don't have a culture of inclusion, you know what, people are just gonna sit back. They're not, they're not going to speak up because they're gonna wonder, hey, are people really gonna listen to me? Or, or they're gonna feel like 
I, I really don't think they're going to listen to me. Mm -hmm. So in, in our business, it was critically important to safety, um, not just to innovation, to moving forward, um, to people's own career paths. And that was really brought home to me by everything that we tried to work on um, after we came back after that accident. Mm -hmm. Continuing off of that idea of inclusion, uh, one of our attendees asked, what do you think is the best path forward or what are some of the best solutions to mitigate the so-called leaky pipeline of women and minorities in STEM careers? Well, we, we absolutely want to have um, a welcoming environment. And um, so obviously that, that means that people who may not be aware of what women or other uh, members of other underrepresented groups, um, the experiences that they may have. Um, it really requires the organization to look at their processes, their procedures, um, you know, how they select people for promotions, how they select people for special development programs. And, and a lot of times um, there are ways to do it that mitigate um, sort of the unconscious biases that really everybody has. Um, so, for example, you know, it used to be at NASA where um, a supervisor would um, be the sole person selecting somebody for promotion. And we've moved to a model where it's actually a panel of people. And it may include people outside that particular department who may value other qualities um, as they look at people. Um, again, they may value qualities like this person really asks good questions. Mm -hmm. And um, if it's say somebody who works in the engineering organization at Johnson Space Center, but supports the International Space Station program, they understand what the program is looking for. And that an 80% answer in three days is much more important than a 95% answer in two weeks, because we have people in space right now, <laughs> you know, and we need a good engineering opinion. And you, know, you may get a, a different view of what people value. And if you also have a variety, um, so a, a diverse people on the panel, again, from different organizations, but also you know, different genders, different racial and ethnic backgrounds, you're more likely to get a, a more well-rounded view and to mitigate you know, one person's um, biases that they may not uh, you know, even be aware of. So, um, so those are some of the things that you can do. And, and we certainly changed um, a lot of our procedures at NASA over the years that I was there um, to help um, make it a more welcoming environment and, and more equitable for people. Mm -hmm. So moving on to, I guess, like looking at the future for you, what's on the horizon for you? Uh, you seem like someone who always has new aspirations in the works. Where do you hope your job will take you in the future? Well, you know, uh, whatever I do, I, I still want to be involved somehow in the science and engineering enterprise. So I, I don't have a specific next step that I'm looking at. You know, I like the fact that um, now that I don't work for NASA full time, I have the opportunity to be involved in a variety of activities. Um, obviously, the National Science Board is a big part of that. I'm also on a couple of corporate boards and I'm on the board of a foundation that um, uh, supports, among other things, actually fundamental science research, as well as informal science outreach and engagement to students. So, um, so I have, a, and then of course I do a lot of other outreach events, like, you know, like this one. <laughs> so the oppor you know, the opportunities that I have to contribute in a variety of different ways to the STEM field is something that I, I just want to continue to be able to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, and then one last question before we move on to completely just audience questions. What are you reading, watching, or listening to right now, STEM related or not? <laughs> well, we've, we've all had a little bit more time for that, I think, <laughs> uh, during the pandemic. But I will mention um, a couple of documentaries that have come out in the last year that I think are very relevant to what we're talking about right now and which are really well done. So one is called Picture a Scientist, and it's uh, specifically about uh, women scientists, right? And over a variety of time periods, some of the things, um, you know, they picked three particular women scientists 
and some of the issues they faced, some um, you know, as old as 20 or 30 years ago and some much more relevant. And I think it shows the variety of ways in which women are um, made to feel maybe that they don't belong. And of course, in some cases, it was actually much more egregious. There was actual sexual harassment. But a lot of times it's just, you know, their name being left off of paper, even though they contributed to it or not getting as much lab space as, you know, a male faculty member who is um, hired at the same time. So really interesting. And then another documentary called um, Coded Bias. And this is about how AI systems are actually um, reflecting the biases that humans have because of course they're developed by humans, right? So either by the algorithms that they use or the data sets that have been fed into uh, machine learning systems, um, they're actually uh, showing bias, you know, in terms of um, these AI systems may be used to de determine who gets promotions and who gets raises. Um, and people consider them, well, this, they must be fair because it's a machine, you know, making these decisions. And, but, but they were developed um, by humans who, again, um, just have unconscious or implicit uh, biases. And so it's, again, a really, really interesting documentary I would recommend. Oh, thank you for sharing. I have actually also seen Picture Scientist and really enjoyed it. So I'm glad yeah. you brought that one up. Yeah. Okay. So now we'll go into um, just going on down the list of attendee questions and also just letting attendees know you're also welcome to raise your hand if you want to ask your question live. We'll call on you and then you're able to unmute and ask the question. But okay. So going from the top of the list, what was the most exciting or memorable thing about being in space? <laughs> I get this question a lot and it's always hard to just say one thing because pretty much everything about being in space is, is exciting. Um, you know, obviously the views of the earth from space are just um, amazing. Um, it, we get, I think, very good high quality um, photos and videos that come down from space every single day now. You can follow astronauts on social media, um, and, but it's still not like being there. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I think uh, that's uh, the thing that astronauts enjoy the most and, and maybe miss the most when they come back on Earth. Um, sometimes I do talk about a particular moment. This was on my last mission. And I was pretty sure, as I mentioned, that I, it would be my last mission or certainly the last one for a long time. And we had uh, participated in the assembly of the International Space Station, added um, the very first piece of the truss structure, which is now... 350 feet long, and it's where the, the large solar rays hang off of. And we brought up the first um, piece, which was about 40 feet long. We spent a week docked, um, attaching it and hooking up all the cables. And so we had just undocked from the station and moved about 40 feet away. And it, we were on the night side of the earth and the station was, was dark, so you couldn't see it very well. But as you look down on earth, you could of course see in city lights, as well as um, the northern lights. So we saw these ghostly green, you know, aurora with uh, red filaments at the end. You know, to me, that's the most science fiction-y thing that you see when you're in space is, is the um, uh, northern or southern lights. And then uh, what we were, we were waiting for sunrise because then we were gonna do a complete fly around in the station and take photos. And that happens so quickly when you're traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. So again, it was kind of science fiction-y because it's like Star Trek where you uncloak, you know, because it's in darkness. And then all of a sudden it's like completely lit uh, by the sun. And of course the solar rays are, are extremely bright and um, just, you know, really memorable views, um, along with the fact that with my crew, we completed our mission um, primarily at that point. And uh, we'd left three crew members on station that had already been up there for four months before we had docked. Um, and just being part of that whole endeavor was um, just a extremely memorable. Wow, that's so beautiful. I've, I've seen the photos and yeah, I just can't imagine that's really cool. Um, okay, going on to the next question from Andrew Yi. Do you miss research in the lab? 
Uh, as a PhD student, all I have known is research, but many other STEM related careers exist, such as yours in NASA administration and the National Science Board. So, you know, I, I moved fairly early on because of being selected as an astronaut from research to operations, although um, I did get to participate in research on my flights. So for example, my first two flights were studying the Earth's atmosphere and the, particularly the problem of the ozone hole and ozone depletion. So I wasn't the PI, you know, I wasn't the one that developed the instruments and I wasn't the one that analyzed the data, but I still get to, got to be a part of it. And that to me was really exciting. And one of the things that I like is the opportunity to learn about a lot of different things. And in a way I got to do that as an astronaut more than I would have as a researcher because you end up bur burrowing pretty deep <laughs> into one area. So I think different things um, you know, are of interest to different people. And, uh, and for a lot of folks, um, you know, burrowing deep into a subject is what really gets them excited. And, and those are the people that um, you know, really excel at research. And I just found I liked the opportunity to learn about a lot of different things and be involved in it from a variety of different kinds of work in different kinds of positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really important as well uh, in finding like, you know, which one do you prefer as a scientist? Right. But there are a lot of different ways to go. And um, sometimes it can be a little bit hard to see that when you're in graduate school because you get very focused on at, on the particular uh, research issue that you are working on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so we actually have an audience member who raised her hand, Ananya. Would you like to ask your question live? Sure. Um, thank you, Dr. Ochoa, for coming. Um, this is super interesting to listen to, very inspiring. Um, when I think of astronauts, um, the first thing that comes to my mind is that they must be very brave to go to space because um, it's not a well-known territory, obviously. <laughs> how, how do you, how are you that brave? Um, how do you know that like, even though there's a risk, you still do it for the greater love of science and for um, wanting to move the knowledge of um, astrophysics forward? Well, first of all, I would have to say I've ne I never would have characterized myself, particularly when I was younger, as a brave person. So if you're sitting there thinking, oh, it must be only people who just are really brave in general, I, I simply would not have described myself that way. <laughs> However, I was really, really excited about the possibility of participating in human spaceflight. And I think, you know, my interest and excitement about that sort of um, overshadowed, you know, the concerns that I might have about safety. And then, um, of course, what you learn during training is a number of things. First of all, you learn in more detail how the shuttle systems or whatever spacecraft you're flying in, how they operate. And learning about them more in detail, um, you know, gives you more confidence in that you understand what is going on. And then you use that information in your training. And a lot of what we train to is um, when things go wrong, when pieces of equipment don't work right, um, you know, and while we can't overcome everything that might happen, there are a lot of things that we can overcome because almost every system um, on spacecraft are redundant. And so if one thing goes out, you know, you can switch over to another a lot. And, you know, nowadays that's pretty much all automatic, although, um, in the space shuttle world, a lot of it, the astronauts or ground control actually had the ability to do that. And so when you're actually you know, sitting on the launch pad for the very first time, um, you know, what, what I really tried to think about to keep from being too nervous or scared was, okay, I've been here a hundred times before. This is just like being in the simulator. You know, we've worked through hundreds of different issues. We've worked as a team, as a crew, um, as well as with the folks in mission control. There's a lot that we can do if things don't go right. And I have things that I need to concentrate and work on during launch. You know, I need to listen to the performance calls. I need to be ready to call up um, a procedure to work through a potential problem. And 
And so your, your brain is busy and uh, you want to be as prepared as possible. And you feel that your training has prepared you. So I, I think it's that preparation and training that allows, um, that'll certainly allowed me to be there and, you know, not be overwhelmed by thinking about all the things that might go wrong. Wow. Yeah. Listening to like the preparation process for astronauts, so intensive. And that makes sense then like once you're actually there that you know what to do. Um, and then also related to that, another attendee asked, what was the most unexpected or surprising thing about being in space? Well, let's see. Um, you know, fortunately, uh, hope there was nothing that was a huge surprise, which is exactly the way that you want it. <laughs> Because again, in our training, um, we hear all the time from astronauts who have already been in space. And part of their job is to pass on, you know, what it's like and tips um, to those of us that haven't already been there. And, and so I, I had a good idea of what to expect. Of course, you can't, you know, totally know what um, all the sensations and sights and how you're gonna operate in zero G. A lot of it, you do have to kind of just do, um, do on the job learning and training and experiencing. But um, for the things that are important, we generally have heard um, you know, about them from, from other astronauts. So I would just say you know, the actual experience itself is just more vivid than anything that you can um, simulate on the ground. I talked about the views from space. You, you really have to learn how to operate in um, zero gravity or we call it microgravity um because you can't really train for that on the ground um, you can just listen to tips from other people and try to be prepared um but uh you know some things are much easier in microgravity like if you have to move a piece of equipment that weighs a lot on the ground well now it's weightless and, and so you don't have to worry about dropping it on your foot or how you're going to move it you know it still takes force to get it started moving right because it still has mass and, and you have to overcome inertia but now um, you have to worry about how you actually stop it from moving. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's quite a bit different. Um, and then some things are harder if you're trying to put together um, some kind of um, you know, research or engineering setup and has different parts and you have di uh, different tools. Um, you have to be very methodical. You can't put anything down without make, making sure that you're either Velcroing it to something or, you know, in some way capturing or attaching it because obviously it'll just float away otherwise. And, um, and so it requires you to concentrate in a way that you sort of just don't do and kind of take for granted on the ground. Wow, yeah. I, yeah, I forget things all the time so I could see how you definitely <laughs> have to train yourself to be in that mindset. Um, okay, cool. So going on to the next audience question, how would you compare your experiences at a DOE, Department of Energy Lab, versus a lab in academia. Versus uh, a lab in academia. Well, so um, obviously the, the, when I worked in a lab in academia, it was as a grad student. So I didn't really have the experience of being you know, a professor, um, a PI who had um, gone off and, and got grants on that. But my experience at the DOE lab is, uh, you know, we were still doing fundamental research. And so in many ways, um, working in a lab there was not too different than what I had done as a graduate student. We just needed to understand how it was of interest to the Department of Energy and sort of be able to explain why it was that we were looking at some of these optical information processing techniques that we were focused on. Um, in both cases, both at Stanford as a grad student and at Sandia National Labs, um, some of the work that I did um, actually led to a patent. And at Stanford, I was a co-inventor along with my PhD advisors. And then at Sandia, a co-inventor with a couple of other people that I was working with there. Um, so in that case, um, they were both interested in technology transfer. And in both cases, I was um, you know, publishing in journals and um, going to conferences and talking about them. So in, in that way, they were uh, quite similar. Yeah, awesome. Uh, thanks for kind of sharing about your experiences in both. And it's really cool that you've been able to 
experienced such a variety of positions ranging from both science to administration. Okay, so the last question that we have is, well, the today said two short, not super deep questions. Um, just for fun, do you still play the flute? And have you picked up any other languages from working with astronauts from other countries? So yes, I do still play the flute. I, um, I went for about 25 years without really the opportunity to take lessons or play in a group. Um, but after I retired from NASA, I, I moved to Boise, Idaho. And one of the first things I did was uh, look for an instructor and start taking lessons again, just for fun. Um, to be able to spend a little more time doing that than I used to. So it's still um, something that's really important to me and, and I enjoy doing it. Um, so I did take some Russian language uh, lessons when I was at NASA, um, you know, not to the point. So, so I was not an astronaut who lived and worked on ISS for months at a time. And you have to get to a certain level of Russian proficiency to be able to do that. However, I was going to spend, um, I was going to meetings in Russia. I did spend a week there training um, prior to one of my um, space station assembly flights and um, often met up with um, either Russian cosmonauts or Russian space agency managers. So it was important to me to be able to read Cyrillic so I could get around on the subway in Moscow on my own. Um, and then to be able to at least be polite in Russian where you can, you know, say, hello, how are you? Nice to meet you. Um, maybe read through a menu and be able to order off of it a little bit. So um, at that time, I, I learned at least enough Russian to be able to do that. Awesome. Nice. <laughs> uh, cool. Yeah. So it's, those are all the questions in the chat, but I wanted to ask you if you had any last words or advice for everyone listen in, listening in today. Um, about career, about becoming an astronaut, just anything you would like to talk about. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you again, Anne. Really appreciated your, um, your moderating. And to um, all the folks, um, I know this was uh, sponsored by uh, Society of Women Engineering. Um, so I, I hope we touched on a lot of subjects. I would just say, you know, um, we need you. We need you in STEM. You know, we need your creativity, your curiosity, um, just the, the hard work and the interest. Um, you're you're going to think of questions to ask as a researcher that maybe other people aren't going to think of. And um, so uh, I hope you'll um, continue in STEM and uh, continue to contribute in, in that way for many, many years to come. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I also want to say a big thank you to everyone from Society of Women Engineers and additional organizations that join us as well from UChicago. And thank you to the National Science and Technology Medals Foundations for hosting the STEM Spotlight Series. And to all the attendees, uh, we would really appreciate it if you could fill out the survey on your way out. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks again, Ellen Ochoa, that was amazing. We loved hearing all of your advice and insights and experience. Thank you. Thank you.